Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, today, wanted to finish out the last of the topics related to solids, liquids, and gases. And yesterday, we walked our way through a bunch of characteristics of phase diagrams. And we learned what a phase diagram was and all these special points on it, like the critical point and the critical pressure. And then we saw that there was a link between the amount of pressure you put on a substance and the temperature, right? And then what phase they existed. There's another representation of the link between uh, temperature and phases, right? but it's a little bit different. It's called a heating curve, all right? And a heating curve generally takes the form that you see right here, right? This would be the heating curve for water. Right? But sometimes you understand it a lot more if you can see how it's built. So what I've done for you here is brought over a generic heating curve and wanted to show you where certain things existed on the curve and what it means when you're looking at certain aspects of the curve. So first thing you need to understand with all heating curves is that it compares temperature over here on the y-axis to heat added. Right? Sometimes you'll also see it listed as time. Right? The curve says that we're constantly adding heat over a period of time and we want to see what happens to the temperature or vice versa. Right, so the first thing I want you to understand is the numbers on the axis vary from substance to substance based on when they boil, when they melt, and all of that gets controlled like we've been talking about with their intermolecular forces. The stronger the substance, the higher the numbers tend to be where these occur. Right, but in general, when we're looking at things at low temperature, when you are on the uphill portion of the graph right here, you are talking about the solid phase of that substance, right? So at really low temps, things tend to be solid. We're adding heat, we're adding heat. Those solids are getting warm, meaning their molecules are vibrating more and more and more and more till eventually you get to right here. And when you get to this point where the graph flatlines, you are no longer just a solid. You undergo a phase change, all right? And we'll talk about those when we go back to the PowerPoint, all right? But while you're in this flatline portion, you're undergoing some sort of phase change. Right, so then if we keep adding heat, we keep adding heat, we overcome the intermolecular forces that are there, right, we press forward into this portion. And when you're on the uphill in this portion, you would be in the liquid phase. Till eventually you've added enough heat that you get to here, and at this point, you have added enough heat that you can overcome the IFs and you can overcome the vapor pressure holding the liquid into the substance together. And we get into this portion and then we've totally separated the molecules. We're into the gas phase. All right, so the uphill portions of the graphs represent your phases. All right, so the gas exists all in this range. Right? Your liquids would exist in these temperature ranges with that amount of heat. And your solids exist down here. Right, and then, like I said, when you're on the flat portion, 
what must be happening in this area, in this area, is you're undergoing a phase change. And it all depends on where you were coming from. Were you adding heat or you removing heat? So on the bottom one here, if you were transitioning in this direction from left to right, you'd be going from a solid to a liquid that represents melting. If you were on the other direction though, for some reason you were cooling the substance, you would be going from a liquid to a solid that would be freezing. And then we jump up to this one. If we were going and adding heat the whole time and I was a liquid and now I'm undergoing the phase change, I, I would be vaporizing. And if I were going this way, where I was a gas and I were cooling it, that would represent condensation. We'd be condensing. All right, so it's the phase itself on the uphills, the flat portions represent the phase changes, right? And we could get two, right? Because phase changes are a two way street. All right, so those are kind of your basics of what's happening. So if I jump back to the PowerPoint here, and we look at this heating curve, it is labeling that in a much cleaner fashion. All right, we've got joules here on the x-axis, that's heat, temp on the y-axis. Right, it shows you your phases. This is specific to water, so our phases have names, right? Solid water is ice, liquid uh, water is water and gaseous water we call steam or water vapor. And those are your phases. And then between B and C, if we were going B to C, we would be melting. But if we were going C to B, we would be freezing. If we were A to B, we're simply heating a solid. C to D, we are simply heating water. But once we get to D, D to E, because we're going water to steam, we would be evaporating or vaporizing. E to D would be condensation because we were steam condensing back down to water. All right, so the only other things that are worth talking about with these are why we see these plateaus. Why is it that when we add heat, temperature is rising, temperature is rising, temperature is rising, but when we get to a phase change, it flatlines on the temperature end of things, even though we continue to add heat. So let's take a look at that. All right, here are some important things that I want you to understand about the flat portions and the uh, steepness of the hill for what's going on. So if we're looking at a heating curve, the first thing I want you to under know is that the phase changes occur on the flat portions of the curve. All right, so again, your phase changes are here in the green and down here in the blue. Here are some things that I didn't mention. How long the flat portion is, how long it takes me to get through that phase change, how much energy it takes me to get through that phase change is controlled by the IFs. The stronger the IFs, the more energy needed to overcome those IFs to get the molecules to separate. So if you see a really long flat portion of a curve, that's telling you that the substances IFs are pretty strong and we numerically calculate those with the math problems we did earlier. That's the heat of fusion and heat of vaporization of a substance. So when you got that kilojoule per mole number, the bigger your kilojoule per mole number, the longer this line tends to be. Right, and if I were to copy and paste this guy real quick, what I'm talking about there is one of these problems. So if I wanted to figure out how long this line's gonna be, right, it was the hole for water, 40.5. 
kilojoules per mole, right? That's its heat of vaporization. And for its heat of fusion down here, the length of this line, it was 6.009 kilojoules per mole. So the reason why the green line is so much longer is because numerically it took a lot more heat, right? Which is down here, right? Heat added over the time. It took a lot more heat to get to the 40.79 kilojoules. And this line is longer because of that. So the IFs, which translates to the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization, control how long the line is. We won't get into this much, the steepness of the line, like why is this line really steep and this line not as steep, has to do with something called a uh, specific heat capacity. Right, but if you want to get into that, um, sign up for AP, right, take that next year. Right, so the take home messages, finishing things out here, is that phase changes occur on the flat portions. The length of the flat portion is represented by the IFs and the heat of fusion and vaporization. So as you see, there's no temperature change during the phase change, right? The substance isn't getting more temperature, but it is getting more heat. And that's a tough idea to understand is why is it that we're adding heat, but the temp isn't going up? So remember, those are two different things. Heat is a form of energy. Temperature reflects molecular motion. So the particles are gaining energy, but they aren't moving anymore. In these portions, the uphill, they're gaining energy and they're moving more, which is why heat's rising and temp is rising. So the million dollar question becomes, well, if we're adding heat, where does it go whenever this temperature has flatlined? And the answer is right what we were talking about here. It goes to breaking the intermolecular forces that you see in substances. So if we jump back to here and I have, say, a solid, right, the solid starts getting heat and it's vibrating and it's vibrating and it's vibrating. So the movement is going up all through this portion right in here. Movement rises, movement rises, movement rises. I, but the moment we get to this point right here that I'm going to put a big old red X on, these guys are not moving faster. All of that heat is then going to breaking the intermolecular forces between them, getting these guys to separate from each other. And then once they're separated, we've overcome that heat of fusion or vaporization. Then all of a sudden the water can start to move faster, move faster, move faster, move faster till we get to here. And now my water particles are going to try to escape into the gas. So we have to overcome the pressure and we have to overcome the IFs that are still here between the water molecules, uh, which there just aren't um, as many connections, but there's more of them because right? we have to separate every single one as opposed to kind of layering things in sheets. So we flatline the temp again during the phase change. And then finally, once we get them all separated into a gas, then the particles will speed up and bounce around. Them. All right, so what I'm trying to show you here in this last one is that the energy during a phase change is used to break the intermolecular forces, right? not speed up the particles. Right? So that's pretty much it with heating in uh, curves and the idea of phase changes. Uh, no new homework on this tonight. That was just the last idea. Uh, tomorrow in class, we'll have regular Zoom meet. I'm sorry, Google meet. And uh, I'll be throwing some review questions out. I'll get you ready for the test I'll give you after class tomorrow that we'll probably make due uh, on Sunday. Uh, like I said, I hope everybody is doing good. And I look forward to uh, seeing you guys all again soon.